Beautifully given. Thank God for that. For God so loved the world, all right, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But tell me, church, but have everlasting life. Aren't you glad you have everlasting life? Thank God because he gave himself. He gave sacrificially. He gave everything physically, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically. He gave it all on the cross. Thank God for it. Romans 9 this evening. We'll begin there. We'll move back to Luke chapter 5. We heard some uh, from Luke chapter 5 already this week. But my prayer is that our burden for our Jerusalem would increase coming out of our World Mission Conference. I'm praying that we'll truly be witnessing in our community. Truly be witnessing our community. I believe God stirred our heart about the need for people to hear the gospel and know the Lord. My friend, the need, really in essence, I believe the need's never been greater in our own community than it is right now. It's a great, I think one, one of, I believe Brother O'Malley mentioned in one of the meetings during, during the evening meetings that the great number of people that claim no, even no religious affiliation in our own county. In Virginia, in Virginia, I'm not talking about some out of the way place, I'm not talking about the big city. No religious affiliation is actually a majority of people in our county. That's remarkable to me. You know what, I, I don't wanna, I don't, I'm not going to drag you into this, but I feel like a failure because of that. That's, I have to take responsibility to some degree for it. I feel like a failure. <laughs> We've got to get the gospel to people. May, may, they, may they at least reject the gospel, but they must be confronted with the gospel. If the majority of the county that I live in Excuse me. There's no religious affiliation. No, and again, I understand there are a lot of nuances in all that. People are tired of organized religion, and I am too. Amen. Yeah, I am too. Uh, I get that. But no, no, no relationship. More than likely, no relationship with God. If that's a majority in the place we live, I don't want that on my account. I don't know about you. I don't want that on my account. Do you? That means I got to do something about it. And I want to do what I can to encourage you to do something about it. And uh, this passage just hits you right in the heart, Romans chapter 9. Paul is such an intelligent man, the Apostle Paul, so well-trained, so knowledgeable. But Paul's passion just, just absolutely leaps off this page as we read these familiar verses. Look with me in Romans chapter 9, if you would. He says here, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I, I could wish... I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of the whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever, amen. I mean, he is worked up about the fact that his own people don't know Christ, they don't know the Lord, that they're going to die and go to hell. And it's so strong, he's, he's, ready to, he's ready to take their hell for them. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't even know how to get there. I don't know how to get there in my heart. God, help me. God, help me. I, I, don't, I, I know how to get there. I actually do know how to get there. I'm just not there yet. And we'll find out about that here in a moment. F.B. Meyer, a great Bible teacher, he said the apostle had got so near the very heart of the Lord that he could hear its throb, detect its heat, Nay, it seemed as though the tender mercies of Jesus uh, to, to these, these Philippians here were throbbing in his own heart. What, what happened here? He's getting so close to the Lord that he, the Savior's passion for the lost, rubbed off on Paul. And again, I want to remind you, he was not with Jesus physically. He's in the same, excuse me, in the same boat that you and I are, not seeing Christ, but following Christ. But he got close enough to the Lord, I agree with F.B. Meyer, that, that he, he, got a, he got God's heart. He absolutely got God's heart. And I believe it. The secret to evangelism is not necessarily just running ragged all over the place. It's not, not as someone said, running around with, like a chicken with your head cut off and doing everything you can. I, and I'm not saying that can't be part of it. But what we need, and, and there's no doubt, we need to do a better job wearing ourselves out for the sake of the gospel. I don't think we've gotten close to that yet. At least I haven't. You know, we're not close to that. We're, we're not spent ourselves for the gospel. We've not spent ourselves for the lost. We're not wore out when it comes to giving the gospel. I don't think any of us are guilty of that. I know I'm not. But what we need is not necessarily figuring out a plan to run around. We need to get close to the Lord. I need to get closer to Jesus. I've got to start in the right place. If, if, if people passing from death unto life is the heart of Jesus, and I love Jesus because he loves me, then I, I, that ought to be more of my heart. Ought to be more of my heart. So, we, yes, we need to do all that we can. But the secret of having a heart for our brothers and sisters is found in our communion with Christ. 
And make no mistake about it, if you and I don't have a heart for the gospel, the problem is not, not giving the gospel. The problem is that we're not close enough to the one who wants us to do it. That's it. it it's a sign that you and I don't have the heart of Jesus for a lost world. It's an indicator we don't care like Jesus cares. And uh, you say, Pastor, how do you know that about me? I don't know it about you, but I sure know it about me. And I'm pretty weird in some respects, but I think we have something in common here. I think we have something in common. We, 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 don't, we don't care like we should. What can we do about that? Honestly, people drive me crazy sometimes. You don't have to say amen right there. You think, what's, what's he doing? He can't be the pastor of our church and talk like that. Well, I'm just telling the truth. People drive me crazy. People drive me crazy. I mean, nobody in this room, obviously, never. But I mean, uh, but I mean, but other people, other people drive you crazy. <laughs> and, and I can get upset. Just I was in traffic this week coming down. I had turned at Ben's church and I was coming up. I need to get in the left hand lane to make a turn to come down Turner Drive. And there was some aggressive driving going on. This time I was not being aggressive. I was I was acting like a mature individual for a change. And I was driving like a normal person. I was actually going the speed limit, put on my blinker to get in that left-hand lane, get plenty of time. And as soon as I put my blinker on, one of, my, one of the dear friends in our county, dear people, just zoomed up in that, just took off like, you're not getting over in this lane. That drives me crazy. Drives me nuts. Now we're about to have revival here. I know it's about to happen. I know this thing's never happened to you, and I, I know this, but... I thought, what is she doing? I put my blinker on like really early. I'm going to get over in the traffic. I mean, this this will work. I don't know her. She don't know me. Why is she trying to do this to me? I'm telling you what, I got, I got upset about it. I didn't like it. Uh, we got to the stoplight, rolled down my window. I said, I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't speed up when I put my blinker on to get over. I just went ahead and told her what I was thinking. <laughs> now, I'm, I hope I can still be your pastor. But I went ahead and told her what was on my mind. And she had some things to say to me that I can't repeat to you. I can't do that. People drive me crazy. We can't start with people. If we're going to reach people for Christ. I'll be honest with you, in that moment, I was not thinking about her eternity. Um, uh, well, I don't want to say too much, but she was ready to send me some places, obviously. She was upset with me because I had spoken to her. I believed I was in the right. She believed she was in the right. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure she might have been right and I could have been wrong. It happens every once in a while, more often than I like. But so people, I use that example because I, I know that never happens to you. I just wanted you to hear that. It, it, people drive you crazy. They're inconsiderate. They're selfish. They think about themselves where they think about you. Uh, they, they, they are not interested in you and your eternity. But I know this, God is. Yes. And so I love, I, if, I could, if I could dial up Shirley Siegel right now and say, sing people need the Lord for us. I'd love to hear it. Some of us have been around here a while know what that sounds like and the heart that she has. She loves people. You know, she loves people. Would you say that if you knew Mrs. Shirley Siegel, she's still going for the Lord, she, she would sing that song, and you knew she was singing the truth. She knew people need the Lord. She could she'd probably quote Romans chapter 9. She's not a perfect woman, but I wasn't the key. Wasn't, she didn't love people first. I think it was her relationship with Jesus that did that, right? And Paul has given us that here. People drive you crazy. And that'll probably be the only quote you get from the sermon tonight. People will drive you crazy. But I want you to know, you're driving somebody crazy too. <laughs> you are. I drove that lady crazy. I, I'm sure I did. I, I probably didn't need to speak to her like that. I didn't say any bad words, but I, I, did, I did let her know I was frustrated. I, I, it's not about people. It's about the Lord. Where's this heart going to come from? It's not because people, the people in Kenya, you've heard this before, and the, and the people in Brazil uh, can be difficult to deal with. The, the, the people in Sardinia, I'm telling you, they're, they're entrenched in false religion. Yeah. That's remarkable. 95% of the people are, are truly Roman Catholic, and that's very difficult to turn around. The power of God can do anything. People can be difficult. They can be difficult. We don't, we don't do it for the people. We do it for the Lord. And if, if I'll get closer to the Lord, I can have the, I'm going to have the heart of Paul. Look here. Number one, you see his earnestness. He's so earnest. He says these words here. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. Now, some of us have to talk like that because nobody ever believes us, right? I'm telling you the truth this time. I'm not, I'm not telling a lie this time. You know some people like that? I know sometimes I have to convince my kids I'm telling them the truth because I tell a few far-fetched stories at our home every once in a while. I'm telling the truth this time, Carson. I promise. I promise I'm telling the truth. But Paul is not saying that. He's truthful. What he's trying to say, this is how earnest I am. I want you to know I'm not, I'm not, I'm not joking. He said, I'm earnest in this. I would be glad to trade places with those who are damned to hell if they could, 
they could, they could pass from death to life. That's, that's amazing, isn't it? I say the truth, I lie not. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Ghost. Paul is wanting to stress the fact that this love for the lost people, this passion is not, no, it was not pretense. You know, God help us. I'm going to tell you what, that could be something you and I are guilty of. That could be something you and I are very guilty of, pretense when it comes to a passion for the lost. Like we know what to say and we certainly know how much to give. But we've, we've got to have a passion to see people uh, God willing, the passion that's in Jesus' heart to see people come to Christ. He's wanting to stress this fact. He's telling the truth. He's not lying. He's saying, look, the Holy Ghost, bear me witness that he has an all-consuming passion for the lost. And if we get a compa- if we get passion for the lost, it's not, again, not going to be because of people. It's because of our communion with Christ. It's going to be being filled with the Holy Ghost. And, and your, your whole conscience, your whole being is going to be transformed by that. Paul had an earnestness for his brethren. That's remarkable. And he had emotions tied to it. You know, emotions sometimes are a sign of weakness, I guess. I don't know, maybe among men, I, I don't know. He said, I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow of, in my heart, he says in verse number 2. But the Bible tells us in Psalm 126, verse number 5 and 6, you probably remember these verses, they that sow in tears, what, shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. A Scottish and English pastor Herbert Lockyer said, Tears win victories. A cold, unfeeling, dry-eyed religion has no place over the souls of men. So the truth is, like I've always heard, if you can take it or leave it, you'll probably leave it. If it doesn't mean anything to me, if, I, if I'm not earnest, if I have no emotion tied to it, and, and then, then maybe I won't be as engaged. And again, it's hard for me to care about people, but if I can get close to the Lord, I will have the heart that he has, and I'll have, there'll be an emotion in it. There'll be a drive in it. There's something that compels me when I'm weary, when I'm frustrated, when I'm tired, when I don't think I have the time, when I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed, a bit overcome, when I'm feeling somewhat embarrassed or unprepared. That God, God will use my union and communion with Christ in an earnest way to do the best I can with, with a care for the lost and certainly the man of sorrows is our example as he wept over Jerusalem and he wept over those that rejected him. Paul here believed that whosoever was not found in the book of life was going to be cast into the lake of fire and lost forever. We believe that. But I, I want it to affect my heart. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. You know, the lady that I got upset with in traffic this week, God helped me to get close to the Lord, so I'll care about her eternity and help me not to do foolish things that would get between her and eternity. If she knew I was the preacher, if she knew I was a Christian, if she knew I was supposed to be witness to her, I'd probably just build a huge brick wall for her to listen to me to say anything. Got to be careful about that. Okay? More than careful, I need to forsake that sort of thing. And I need, to, I need to care. I will care about people I don't like if I'll be close to the Lord. That I would naturally be prone not to care for. I'll care about them. And I can, I can, I've found myself at times doing that when I'm close to the Lord. I'm sure you have too. There's an earnestness in Paul. He said, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying. Uh, the, the, and you can ask the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you. And, and, and I've, I've got a continual heaviness in my heart and my soul about this for my people. For my people. The people driving up and down Route 10 or cutting you off in traffic. The people that don't want to listen to you. The, you know, I, I've had it a few times. I'm not a great witness like I ought to be. I can remember a few years ago I was over in Hampton. I think I've told you this story before, but I got stirred up about giving out gospel tracts, and I thought a great place to do that would be at the gas pump at Wawa. I thought it was a great idea. The guy next to me thought it was a horrible idea. He didn't like it at all. He pretty much just, he just sent me, said, man, would you get out of my face with that and leave me alone? <laughs> I don't want to hear that. It's about 7 o'clock in the morning. I don't think he wanted to hear anything, actually. I understand, I think I can understand that, but he needed to hear that. He needed at least, at least take that gospel track, you know. And the devil's used that since then to stop me from giving tracks out sometimes. And I can do it, but, but that, this is the key. An earnestness, there ought to be some emotion. And if you and I have a hard heart about the eternal lostness of people, then we need to get close to Jesus again, don't we? I mean, that's what prompted Jesus to leave the glory of heaven. And come to the sin-cursed earth. He was born and, and as a baby at a manger. We, we've rehearsed this many times. He took on this robe of flesh. It was so humiliating. And then he was called every name in the book. Things that we wouldn't even say out loud. All through his life. And he was mocked while he hung there on the cross. The people he was dying for were making fun of him. They were gambling for his garments. I'm telling you. And then he says, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. 
He's God. He has that capacity. But if you and I know the Lord, our capacity could be in increased and enlarged. Ultimately, there's an exchange that Paul was willing to make here, isn't there? I've already alluded to this. But the word accursed, we find it also over in, in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 8. It's where Paul wrote to his Galatian friends, If any man preach another gospel unto you than the one that we have preached, let him be accursed. There's only one gospel. There's only one gospel. I've been talking to Dave Preston over the last couple of days about uh, getting some folks together and going out there and, and talking about that gospel. I'll tell you what, I I've been to Utah a couple of times. I've witnessed to Mormons giving gospel tracts. I've helped sign them up for Bible studies. They were excited about it. We were talking about, we were using the same words, but we were talking about it. They were talking about a different gospel. Yeah. Different gospel. If any man come unto you and preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. Let me just tell you what that means. Excuse me, but this is what it means. Let his soul be damned to hell. That's what that means. And Paul is saying here, he's using that same word in reference to himself when it comes to the eternal, the eternal life of his people. Let my soul be damned to hell. Let me be anathema. He's described delivering his soul to the judicial wrath of God for sin. And the judicial wrath of God is what you and I have been delivered from. Our sin was judged in Jesus. If your sin is not judged in Jesus, you will be judged for eternity in a place called hell. That's just that's the fact. That's a fact. One commentator said it seems incredible that a man would desire to be damned in order that the damned might be saved. There's another man in God's word that had this same heart. You remember Moses? Yeah. Exodus chapter 32. In verse 32, Moses said to the Lord, He said, Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray out of the book which thou hast written. Interesting, he's referring to that book in Exodus. <laughs> and Moses for all of his faults. You know, he, he was on the backside of the desert running from the Lord. God came after him. He listened to that bush. He got right with God. He struggled to obey the Lord. All these things. But man, he had quite a heart for those rebellious people. They're rebellious. They're hard to deal with. He had a pretty amazing relationship with the Lord, didn't he? Mm -hmm. he had an amazing relationship with God. I think that's what made the difference. He said, don't, don't blot them out. Blot me out. Don't, don't blot them out. Don't blot... My wife out, blot me out. Don't, don't blot my children out, blot me out. Don't, don't blot my neighbor out, blot me out. Don't blot, don't, blot, don't blot my husband out, blot me out of the book. You may, you may be able to have that heart for your family. Maybe God would help us have that heart for this community. If we love like this, you know, we, I, believe, I do believe the outreach meetings of this church would be better attended. This is just a fact. We must, we must, we must get back to reaching people with the gospel. We must. We must do that. You, you're not, you don't have to reserve it for those times only for 6.30 on Thursday or 10 a.m. for a Saturday. But I implore you, I beg you, if you believe in the gospel, you must engage yourself in giving the gospel or it's all pretense. There is no earnestness. There is no emotion. There will be no exchange if you and I don't go with it. And we'll just talk about it. And we might give people money to go do it. But that's not what God had in mind when he said go into all the world. And preach the gospel to every creature. He was talking to some people. He says I want you to do it. And I want you to do it. And he was talking to everybody there. I want you to do it. I want you to do it. That's it isn't it. And the good news is that it doesn't have to be some robot effort. It can be something that we enjoy, something that we care about. And we just do it and we leave the, leave the results for God. God help us. God help us. I need help in this area. I, I know our church needs help in this area. I want us to get back. And by God's grace, I believe the Lord wants us to get back to, to going after souls. It's not something just revert, reserved for missionaries and preachers, but I'm glad for the examples that we have in history. David Brainerd. One of the most celebrated Christian missionaries. He was laboring among poor Indians. By the way, his life was cut short. What was it, 29 maybe? I think 29. He lived to be 29 years old. He said this as, as he was on the banks of the Delaware River. He said, I care not where I live, what hardships I go through, so that I can but gain souls to Christ. While I am asleep, I dream of these things. How about that? He said, as soon as I wake, the first thing on my mind is this great work. All my desire is the conversion of sinners, and all my hope is in God. Those words are admirable, but I'm almost dumbfounded by them. But I, I think that's what led him to leave the confines 
of the comforts of home and to go where he went to. And, and I believe it was tuberculosis or something of that nature, a respiratory illness that took his life. And you and I don't want to do that. I, I know you and I are not, not necessarily trying to sign up for something like that. Uh, but I, I admire I remember that. But we're not we're not looking for necessarily for David Brainers. We're looking for somebody just hand out some gospel tracts and try to witness to people. God is. That's what God's looking for. We're looking at verse chapter 10 of Romans. It says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He's made he's clarifying all this here in the next chapter. And God help us to do that. God help us to do all of that. And we just need to get, get down to wanting to. We want to do what God wants us to do, and then we just need to do the way God wants us to do it. Luke chapter 5, and we're done. I'm going to take just a few minutes. Brother O'Malley dealt with these things, and so he left nothing on the plate for me, that's for sure. If God ever allows me to be in a meeting with Brother O'Malley, I want to make sure I'm preaching first. Amen. <laughs> I just want to do that, so that'll be the way it goes. <laughs> Otherwise, I cannot participate. <laughs> Aren't you glad for men like that to give themselves to the word of God? Yes. Helped us all. But he talked about some of this some. We've preached through it ourselves. So look here. Uh, thou, thou, you're going to catch men. That's what we're going to do. Look here. And it came to pass, verse 1, that as people press upon him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesar, he saw two ships standing on the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that it would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught people out of the ship. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we've toiled all night long and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes in their net break, and they beckoned under their partners, which were in the other, uh, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so also was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus saith unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to the land, they forsook all. They forsook all. They forsook all. And they followed me. They, they forsook all and followed me. So what are we going to do? We've got we to have the want to, but what are we going to do? We're gonna, I tell you what we're going to do. What it says in verse 1, we're going to preach the word of God. What do you have to tell somebody? Uh, your testimony, but it, it, should be in, it should be enshrouded in the truth of the word of God. Uh, we, we live in a society that doesn't even know the true nature of God and the gospel. We believe in preaching. And we believe that preaching takes place here, but it also takes place out in the highways and byways. And our belief affects what we do. We're going to win them preaching the truth of God's word. We're not going to win people with activities. We're not going to win people being winsome. We're not going to win people being cute. We're going to win people being, truth, being truthful. That's how we're going to win people. Remember, I've, quote, I've quoted Susan Ivan many times. At least she's the first one I heard say that. She said, what you win them with is what you win them to. And what we're going to win them with, Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. We're going to preach that. We're going to obey the Lord's commands. Verse number four, he said what? Launch out into the deep. Let down your nets. Sometimes when it comes to fishing for souls, the issue is not how good we are at persuading people. It's whether we're obeying the master when his spirit directs us to give the gospel. It's not about our persuasion powers. God blesses obedience, so obey the Lord. Oh, just obey the Lord. You know what else we can do? Verse number seven. We can work together as a team. That's, that's what God's intended us to do in this local church. They beckon under their partners. That word comes up again in another verse, but the mission, this is the mission of the entire church, and we can encourage one another. God, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting that Jesus sent people out, what, two by two. You know, I, there are times when I have to visit by myself. It never goes as well as when I have a partner. Trust me. It never goes as well. It just never goes as well. If there's an odd man out, I'll try to be that odd man for the sake of other people in our, in our times together. But, but Jesus sent people out two by two, and there's a lot of encouragement and a lot of accountability there. You know, I, I would love to see in our church just develop partnerships where you, you know you're meeting at Thursday night or you know you're meeting at Saturday. You, you two are partners, and you're going out, and you're going to go see somebody, try to get the gospel, maybe see somebody saved. Mark chapter 6 says that he called unto them to twelve and began to send them forth two by two and he gave them power over the unclean spirits. God, that's what God wants us to do. We can work together as a team. You don't have to be the lone ranger. In fact, if you're a lone ranger, you're not going to work very well in the local church. 
I, pe- I think people struggle with that fact now more than ever, that we're all part of a team. And we're not here to do one person's bidding. And we're not, we don't come together so we can s- separate and segregate. <laughs> we come together so we can work together. And it takes yielding our will to God's will and one another's will. You know what I'm talking about? Teamwork is so hard to come by in this day and age because it's a self-life is on display everywhere, even sometimes in the local church. I I could be given to that. May God help us to work together as a team. You know what else we need to do? Verse number eight. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down on Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, Lord. I tell you what we need is a good old-fashioned dose of humility. Oh, God help us. You know, if I'd have more humility, I probably would have not been so upset about that lady cutting me off in traffic or whatever. I need to be more, more humble. I don't deserve, I don't deserve, I mean, that maybe just seems like a simple thing, but who do I think I am? <laughs> it's not really a big deal. I made it a big deal, you know why? Because I wasn't getting what I wanted in that moment, as insignificant as it was. we got to be humble. Peter saw the grace of God. He felt unworthy. And I'll tell you this, if we're going to, if we're going to reach the loss, God help us to not do it with a cocky attitude. I don't want to be demeaning, but there's some people take that approach. Uh, They've got something people need, and they better listen. I'll tell you what, that's not the spirit of Paul in Romans chapter 9. I think people need to listen, but my goodness, we're not here to scream at people and yell at people and put people in a headlock, so to speak. Excuse me. But the truth of God will arrest them. But, But we need to be humble. Don't we need that? That's the Lord's work. It's our privilege to represent the Lord. It's my privilege to talk to somebody about the Lord. Then I don't have some right to force them to listen to me. But if I have the power of God on my life and a humble spirit about what God's done in my life, I think that's going to help me to adorn the doctrine, God willing. Paul wrote there in the book of Titus. And, and God help us. Now, we can be humble, but then verse number 10, look at this. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus saith unto Simon, fear not. We can be humble, but let's be fearless. Let's be fearless. Proverbs 28 verse 1 says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. I mean, we're on the Lord's side, friend. So if, if someone rejects us, they're rejecting the Lord, and I don't take that lightly, but, but I, I, listen, we're going to be fine. <laughs> we're going to be fine, and, and thank God we may face more, more opposition, but right now all we have to face is a little embarrassment. We should be respectful but not live in fear of people's opinions or their rejection and they're actually rejecting Christ. Verse number 11, quickly. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. And we, we were following Jesus. That's what we're doing. If we're true followers of Christ, we are going to be a witness. I mean, it's kind of it just the two go hand in hand, don't they? When we're close to the Lord, we're, we're thinking about people the way he does. And then we stay connected to him. We draw strength to him. We keep our spiritual tank full so we can minister to other people. When my tank gets empty, I've got nothing to give them. I've got nothing to give them. So... You know, your tanks, if you're, if, if you're expecting today to keep you full all week, I'm, I probably should have studied more. I should have worked harder. Truth is, it doesn't matter how well I may so-called preach on a Sunday or one of our other men preach on a Sunday, you're, you're responsible to feed yourself and to keep your tank full. Now, I believe God's or- organized and ordained what we're doing the right way to help you. But don't think that you, can, you can't eat two or three meals a week and survive well. Probably a lot thinner maybe, but I don't think you'd be very strong. So follow him, stay connected, all those sorts of things. And one last verse here, Mark cha- in the book of Mark, chapter 1, and we're, we are actually done this time. I've had th- uh, two different endings now. God, please forgive me. Jesus is, is uh, ex- expanding on all this. While you're turning, I'll read verse 16 in Mark chapter 1. Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, and, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, come after me. So he's, that's another uh, iteration of uh, another uh, reiteration of following him. We're following him. We follow Christ. We're going to be fishers of men. He says, and I will make you fishers of men. And what we realize is this is the Lord's work. work. You and I think, I'm, I'm not a great witness. I'm not a great, I'm great winning people to the Lord. It's kind of embarrassing. People wonder what I'm talking about. They think I'm crazy. Whatever it is you put in your mind, those are the th- thoughts I may have in my mind. But, you know, this is the Lord's work. He says, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. If you'll follow him, he will do the work for you. He'll turn you into one of these weird fishermen. <laughs> They're going after people. He will, he will do that. 
And, and God makes us a fisherman. And by the way, he gives the increase, right? You remember this. You don't have to turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I have planted a polished water, but God gave the increase. Don't be upset when someone doesn't bow their head and close their eyes and accept Christ right there. You don't know where you're at in the continuum of watering and planting and watering and increase. You just don't know where you're at in all of it. Now, we want to see a harvest. Amen. I trust it's for God's glory. But let's get right back to where Paul was in Romans 9. He said, uh, he said, I, I'll, I'll tell you the truth, I lie not. Ask the Holy Ghost. My heart is heavy. I wish that I could be accursed so that other people could be saved. And uh, I, I can't say that. I, don't, I can't say that most of the time. But what I'm going to make up my mind to do is try to get closer to the Lord so that my heart of compassion for the lost will grow. And I won't just say people ought to be saved. And I won't just support people to go talk to them but I will actually get engaged in giving the gospel to other people. God, help me to do that. God, help our church to do that. If we don't do it, if we refuse to do it, if we fail to do it, if we get too busy to do it, then we, we have quite a stewardship, quite an accountability with the Lord when we see him. Because this is, this is the big thing. This is the main thing. Getting the gospel to people. Somebody said, keep the main thing the main thing. We do it for God's glory. But this is why he's left us here, to reach people. God, help us to do it. I, I ask you right now, before you close your eyes and bow your head for the lights go down and we get all quiet around here, how are you going to do it? What are, what are you going to do? What am I going to do? Get the tracks. There's got the gospel film cards. You can use some of those. You got a QR code on it. Be bold enough to speak to somebody. I want to encourage you to attend our organized times of visitation. We'll partner you with people. We'll try to do our best to take care of you. We're seeing new move-ins. we got a host of people need to be seen, host of people need to be seen uh, in this county, people we need to follow up with. But you've got to decide, you know what I'm saying is right. I know what I'm saying is right because it's in the Bible. What are we going to do about it? We've got to commit ourselves to getting the gospel out. Let's get specific about how we're going to do it this week, this week. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.